Kennedy and a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. First on the agenda at tonight's meeting is the minutes. Make a motion to accept the minutes of the Committee of the Whole meeting on February 13th, 2020. Second. There's a second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The minutes are accepted. Make a motion to accept the third regular meeting on February 13th, 2020. Second. There's a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. The minutes are accepted. Next on the agenda is uh, appointments and elections. Superintendent Tutwiler. Sure. And there are three this evening. I do not see uh, the three appointees here, but I'm happy to uh, make public uh, their uh, appointments all in uh, interim uh, fashion. Tim Roach as the interim network administrator, April Reed as the interim payroll manager, and Sean McManus, the interim assistant network manager, all very talented uh, professionals, and uh, I'm sure we'll do a good job in their uh, in their interim uh, capacity. Great, thank you, and we welcome them. Uh, next on the agenda is presentations. Dr. Tutwiler, that's all me. I think I'm going to be talking a lot tonight. Good. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. Looking forward, forward to the discussion. Yeah, if we could just do okay. So, uh, as we typically do every year, at least for the past uh, five years, including this year, um, we present graduation and dropout data. Um, this time around, uh, it's a little bit early. Typically, that um, presentation happens in April or May. Uh, but we have graduation data analyzed and ready to go, and I'm happy to share. And uh, just yesterday got dropout data analyzed and ready to go, so at uh, probably our next meeting I'll share that data. Um, but before, before we dive in, I probably should mention or the, the group should probably think about um, maybe doing things slightly different relative to these presentations, reason being you're going to hear about uh, the graduation data today and then because it's a pretty prominent piece of the accountability. You're going to hear about it again um, in October or November, whenever we're ready to present the accountability data. It's the same set of data. So this data today impacts the accountability that will, will come out publicly uh, in the fall. And um, when I get into the data, you'll see that we, we, it's pretty steady, or it has been pretty steady over the past six years. And from one perspective, that's good, and from another, it's bad. And I'll say more about that uh, in just a minute. But from year to year, there's not real precipitous changes. And so we might want to think about, or I'd ask you to think about, whether you want to do an every other year deep dive so you can see um, more from a trend standpoint how things are going. Just a thought. So we'll dive in, and I know for the folks seated here, it's kind of hard to see, but I did uh, include, you got last Friday um, a one-pager, but the PowerPoint should be in your packets. Um, this is a six-year historical and comparative uh, chart, uh, Lynn Public Schools compared to Boston, Brockton, Lawrence, and Springfield. And as I was just saying, if you look at Lynn, the Lynn Public Schools, which is all the way to the left, uh, it's pretty flat. Um, it's within a two percentage range, 75, um, 74 percent, uh, in one case 73, uh, over the past six years. Um, the good news from on high is that um, we did increase um, with the four-year uh, cohort graduation by uh, almost a full percentage point. Um, and compared to uh, our peer districts, um, that's good because all of them uh, actually uh, had a, experienced a slight dip. So uh, Lynn did increase, but our, our, our peer districts uh, saw a decrease. So that is good. Peeling back the layers, uh, if this will cooperate with me. There we go. Looking at individual schools, 
Um, you can see at the far left, that's again the Lynn Public Schools. It looks pretty flat. Um, when you look at individual schools, there's a little more variability uh, in the outcomes over the years. Uh, we've got two things to celebrate here and then two things that um, I'll express a concern about. Uh, the first uh, on that chart is LVTI. Um, their four-year graduation rate uh, for 2019, it was 89.5. Uh, I like to round up, so that's almost 90 percent or 90 percent, which is, which is excellent. Um, if you go on the DESE website and you find yourself with absolutely nothing to do, go on the web, DESE website and you can see graduation data and it goes back to the year 20, uh, 2006, so 13 years ago. At that point, uh, the graduation uh, rate for tech was 60 percent. So you, you've seen a 30 percent upswing uh, and there's lots of reasons why that is, but uh, nonetheless, this is the highest rate uh, in each of those 13 years. So that is cause for celebration. Going over one chart also cause for celebration, and I'll, I'll shout her out because she's sitting right back there. Lynn Classical saw about a 7% increase in their graduation uh, at 84. Oh, no, I don't have like 82.5. 82. 82.5. Um, uh, essentially a 7% increase. Um, later on in this uh, meeting in my superintendent's report, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that they've been doing as part of their turnaround plan. Um, but this is absolutely uh, a, a, a wonderful outcome for Lynn Classical. They, uh, targets have been released, and this is uh, reflective of exceeding their target, so they will get the full four points in their accountability uh, for the fall on graduation, which is excellent. Um, I'm going to stop there and say that there is a, a connection between that increase, and if you go all the way to the right, you see Fect O'Leary was notably lower. There is a slight connection between that, and I'll, I'll talk about that when I get to, to, to Fecto. Lynn English um, has been fairly steady over the past three years, uh, but on a decline nonetheless, and that's concerning for us um, and for that school. Um, Seventy percent uh, is, is, is getting close to the point where that would push them into automatic turnaround status. That is 66.7, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Once you hit that graduation rate, you're automatically in turnaround status. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, later on in the presentation about the work that's being done and some of the thinking, quite frankly, that, that needs to change if we expect that number to change. Uh, and last but not least, Fecto Leary, um, which holds a special place in my heart, and we know, um, we know who that school serves um, and the hard work that they do. Uh, and that outcome is not reflective at all of the hard work that they do. Four years ago, um, when there was a significant increase um, uh, or influx of um, English learners, newcomers, um, the superintendent uh, made a decision to place uh, a number of them at Fect O'Leary simply for space uh, uh, concerns. Um, well, the students who were there are reflected at that time, the English learners that were there are reflected in that uh, graduation data. And unfortunately, um, a lot of those students uh, dropped out or did not graduate. And uh, there's a connection between that decrease and classical's increase. Um, th those were some of those students would have been classical students. I'm not at all taking anything away from the hard work that Classical is doing. I think they know that I'm a big supporter and there are things to celebrate, and I'll talk more about that in my superintendent's report, um, but just want to be transparent about why there's such a precipitous increase there and a precipitous decrease at Fect O'Leary. John. Would, Excuse me, Mr. Ford. That's actually for him Ford. to call, not me. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Member would Ford. the unaccompanied minor situation affect that fact? Are they included? Because I know that was an issue that every April they go to work. If you enroll in the Lynn Public Schools as a high school student, you are counted if you 
leave and go to work or leave and don't come back, you are counted as a dropout. So yes. I know, I know the first year was something like 45 kids just automatically dropped out of class right. school. I'm going to say something about that uh, toward the end of the, the presentation. Uh, uh, so as we typically do, hang on, i got to go back one. And there we go. Um, we always you know, look at the next layers of data, um, the who behind the numbers, and look at subgroup uh, outcomes here. Uh, this line chart shows the four-year graduation rate over the past six years. Uh, for all students, students with disabilities and English learners, males and females. Uh, the graduation rate for all students has consistently held steady in the mid-70 range. That's that red line. It's straight across, which again, depending on the perspective, it's good or bad. With a slight uptick to 74.8% 74 in 2019. The English learner graduation rate is trending upward over the past two years, and after three consecutive years of increases, the students with disability group decreased in 2019. Now, here's where line charts, charts in general, can be misleading. You can look at that and say, geez, like, that's a pretty significant decrease, but that's about a 2% decrease that you're looking at there. So just want to put that out there. As we look across uh, racial groups, um, the African American, Asian, white, and white subgroups have seen their graduation rates trend upward over the past six years, with the exception of the African American subgroup from 2017 to 2018, but it did increase in 2019. The Hispanic subgroup have seen, has seen its graduation rate slightly decline over the past six years, but, but has had increases in the past two years. The Hispanic subgroup remains below the overall student graduation rate, but the gap versus the overall student population is closing. And to be clear, because uh, folks uh, can't, I don't know, folks can see the colors, but uh, Hispanic is the green uh, at the bottom. The stacked column chart shows the graduation status of LPS students over the past six years. The graduation statuses have remained, and this is a theme, relatively the same for each status category over the past six years. With slight increases in the cohort graduation rates in the past two years, as well as decreases in cohort dropout percentages over the past two years. So as you can see, as you look across from left to right, there, there's not significant changes from year to year. So this next slide is one um, for those folks who have been on the committee for, um, if this is your fifth year, then this would be your fifth time seeing this slide, and the next one as well. Um, we are aware, we are familiar with the risk factors involved in um, prohibiting a student uh, from graduating or causing a student to drop out. All research identified uh, elements, uh, absenteeism, um, you know, failing one course in ninth grade being a significant factor, um, if the student fails to be promoted from one grade to the next, um, frequent infractions of the discipline code, all things that we are knowledgeable about and try to intervene um, with our four-pronged approach. We want to start with education, monitor and identify when there's a, an issue, support and intervene when that, int when that issue has been identified, and then provide a host of alternatives. This slide is the same slide with maybe one or two tweaks um, that I presented when I was a deputy superintendent uh, beginning five years ago. So that, that's kind of the problem that I wanted to, um, to address. Um, uh, two or three meetings ago, Deputy Superintendent Powers did what I thought uh, was a, a pretty powerful presentation on our attendance data, and she talked about how you, you can't continue to do things the same and expect a different outcome. 
you have to entertain a radical shift if you expect things to be different. I don't want to come back here in five years, if you'll have me for that long, and present to you data that shows our graduation rate in the mid-70s. That would be a failure on my part. We have to do something different. We have to do things different. And some of the the different thinking is starting to occur. For example, um, we need to, and this is where the Student Opportunity Act comes in, thoughtfully and significantly increase health supports. And we're not talking about a little bit. We're talking about significant. Um, We need to think about doing high, designing high, the high school day differently. I mean, we've been talking about for years the groups of students who, quite frankly, are prominent in our dropout um, data, whose hierarchy of need causes them um, to work 20, 30, 40 hours a week, uh, which makes being at school from 8 to 2.30 challenging. But we've not done anything about making that accessible to them. So it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody year after year to come back with the same dropout data. We need to do something differently. And we're this close um, to coming up with a schedule that accommodates um, that those students' needs. We need to provide meaningful um, alternatives. And I'm not impugning the efforts of our team in previous years. People are well-intentioned and they're working hard. Um, But things like the After Dark program are are a game changer. Um, This is an opportunity for students to get their core content at English and Classical and then go over to tech and earn an industry-recognized credential. The TAP program is awesome, and Brian O'Connell knows I love him to pieces, but that's that's just the beginning, right? The After Dark program is really a Chapter 74 recognized program. That sort of change is going to make a difference. And then finally, um, the leadership team uh, this year has engaged in what I would call a professional development experience um, around equity. We we really need to put a different lens on when we're looking at data uh, and when we're asking questions about why certain things uh, aren't happening. Um, and th- these are the, through this professional development and through our deep conversations, we're starting to do that. And I think that's going to yield different outcomes for students. And so um, I meant what I said. I don't want to come back here five years from now and say our graduation rate is 75%. That would mean that we've not done anything radically different as we've done with our attendance uh, initiative. Questions I can answer. Questions? Uh, Member Satterwhite, and then Member Nicholson. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tautwala, for this uh, information. Um, I just have some questions, and I I, I know that um, for uh, a long period of time we were underfunded, and we had unfunded mandates, and um, we can only do so much what we have, and that obviously uh, is impacted by the data that we have because we're not able to uh, provide the supports that the teachers need and our students need, um, and hopefully that's going to change um, in the near future. Um, we've all, we've had night schools for for our, our kids, correct, for a, mm-hmm. a long period of time. We 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 so we we have um, I guess you can say alternative high school scheduling per se uh, for some students if you have night school and day mm-hmm. school. Mm-hmm. So if someone has to work in the morning the alternative would be go to school at night. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's there. Um, what do you think will change for it to work for, for students because they have the opportunity to, to either go in the daytime or the nighttime if, mm-hmm. if, it's, if it's not working out? So um, I have to double check on what, our, um, uh, what the evening program enrollment is right now. I want to say it's about 150 students. I could be wrong about that. Um, and there have been some things that we've done differently there, like add social workers, um, add those supports. We've added um, ESL teachers to support the needs of English learners there. Um, but night school is typically when a lot of these students, when that happens when they're at work. Um, they're available um, for, like, in my, in my opinion, available and ready late morning to, to afternoon. So... 
we need to come up with something that would accommodate that particular in between. Right. And and since and if I could add one other thing, I I, I it's going to sound like I'm uh, not appreciative of the significant increase that we're about to um, uh, enjoy in the the, the uh, ensuing fiscal year, but. It's not just about that. There are a number of things that can be done that are budget neutral that just haven't been done. And the credit recovery that we put in place with regards to the attendance policy, has that made any impact? Um, credit recovery with regard to the attendance policy. Yes. If you're gain back their grade in the oh 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 okay. yes. when when people say credit recovery I immediately go to the computer based class oh no no no, no, no. Um, I, I don't have that data yet um, but I will tell you having spoken to students about um, the the fact that if they don't meet the attendance um, requirements in one quarter and can earn back whatever grade um, you know they earned in the previous quarter by meeting them in the second one. They love that idea, okay. uh, and and they love the idea of not receiving the F, um, receiving the D minus, just in case they don't meet it the mm -hmm. next one. So, okay. thank you, Member Nicholson, then Member Gately, and then Member Castellanos. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the pr presentation. Really no appreciate that. Um, I know that there's the issues you mentioned around the data with the individual high school data, but that that's a remarkable increase for, for classical. Totally. Um, and, and that's Pause for celebration. Absolutely. Very exciting. Um, so one, the first question I had was around the comparisons. What, what makes these the four cities yeah. to be compared with? <laughs> so uh, Josh and I were, were joking about this uh, because – um, last year uh, was the first year that I, in the past five, that I didn't do it. And uh, a selection of, of peer schools was made that is different by one school. Do you, you know what I'm thinking about? Lowell? Yes. Yeah. Right. Who, who um, Lowell doesn't know it, but I'm in a fight with him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's who I look at. Like, I, I want to, I think we can, that's a competitive spirit. Um, but what, what uh, Josh decided, and I think it's smart, is like once you have a set of schools, you don't want to be changing them from year to year. It needs to be those set of schools. Mm -hmm. So when he and I had that conversation, hey, I noticed Lowell wasn't here, and we did not beat them. He's like, no, 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 I'm not cherry-picking districts that we did perform better than. Um, those were the exact same ones that I chose last year. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because I, I tend to agree that I, I obviously consistency is helpful, but it's also, I think, helpful to have that aspirational sure. Sure. Um, sure, sure. comparison. Mm -hmm. Along those same lines, uh, the LVTA, the LV, LVTA graduate is, is really impressive, totally. and that change over time is, is just inspiring to mm -hmm. think that you could mm -hmm. make that kind of a, a difference. Uh, the are, 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 is LVTI or have you compared that rate to other similar vocational schools? Because it's not apples to apples to compare necessarily with our other high schools. I mean, I I I wouldn't do that, uh, and the reason why, unless it was to another in district vocational school, most of them are regional, which is just not apples to apples. Um, but, I, I, you know, we could, I've not done that, but we could look at Putnam in Springfield, I, maybe Madison Park in Boston, which I, I, I feel, uh, the, the tech school in Worcester, we could do that. Okay. Yeah. Isn't that regional? Though? I don't know. I thought it was part of their district. I, I think it, the Worcester regional, I, I think it's regional, but I could be wrong. Yeah. Putnam, I know, is an in-district, okay. and Madison, I know, but Worcester, I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, I think in, my, in terms of thinking about the right peer groups sure. that might be helpful. Yeah. Um, so on the FECTO data, uh, is do we have the capability from a data perspective? Because I totally hear what you're saying about how the, the student population is changing, and so we should expect the, the data to be changing. Is there a way to look at, to separate out what the, the grad rate would have been? I think this is maybe uh, a question not just for FECTO, but across all the high schools, because it, you know if we're thinking about are these interventions working, one of the challenges of answering that question is that the, the student population is changing. So it could very well be that these interventions would have increased the graduation rate, uh, but for the fact that our student population has changed. So is there a way that we can isolate that data so that we can uh, be, be understand more about that dynamic? 
Uh, yes. Um, I mean, Josh is a much better statistician than I am. Uh, he compiles these. But I can just tell you at a glance, uh, when I look at the graduate four-year graduation rate for all of the subgroups except for the one, um, the English learner subgroup, it's pretty much in line with where FECTO has been in previous years. The, percent, the graduation percentage for English learners for FECTO uh, for 2019 was zero. So that brought, and, and when you have a small uh, N, a small number, um, e even if it's a few students, it impacts it pretty, sig pretty significantly. But that brought their data way down. Got it. Um, and then for the, the uh, four-pronged approach, or sorry, the last slide about the, the unless you do something different, I, I totally agree, and I really appreciate your uh, uh, attitude about that. So if you, if you feel like if you're here in five years and the graduation, you're safe, the graduation rate is the same, that would be a failure. What, what would be part. a success? What, 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 what are we looking for to say this is successful? You always do this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I do, and yeah. I think it's. Uh, I, yeah. I think part of the reason yeah. is um, it, when we have a target, it, it helps us uh, understand year to year. Are we are we getting to where we want to be? Yeah. So um, this might get me in trouble with my colleagues, and and there's there's risk in putting something out there because then you can say five years ago you said. Uh, but I think that we're capable capable of being in the low 80s okay. as a district. Um, and then the last question I had about that, I think everything you said about the After Dark program, I, I totally agree with, and I'm super excited about that. Uh, what kind of numbers do you think you need to have for that program to start to see an impact in the district-wide graduation rate? Yeah, that's that. That's a good question. I mean, first we, we have to face the reality that they can only accommodate so many students, and I don't have that number. Um, but I can tell you that the shops have regulations around how many students can be there at a time. Um, but you know, I, I, I would say you know this is a, a wild guess, but conservatively, a hundred students I think would make a significant impact. If you're talking about a hundred students being completely engaged, anchored in a program over two years, which is really what they would need to get the 900 hours in a shop for it to qualify as a Chapter 74, I mean, that that would be incredible. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's what I would be. But I don't know. See, this is a Josh question. I don't know what the impact of 100 would be on the overall data. And, and this is part of why I ask about what what – uh, grad, graduation rate we're, we're like aiming towards because then we can think about okay well if After Dark hits its full potential this is how far that gets us mm -hmm. to close that gap mm -hmm. um, but yeah that, that makes sense That's yeah. cool. and, and, and you know it, it's not the be all end all I, in some ways it is but each year Desi does publish uh, target targets for the district right yeah, which are incremental um so we, at a, at a minimum, want to be hitting those. But um, if, we're, if we're talking about where I think we could be, it'd be in the low 80s. Yeah, and, and, and we've had this conversation, but the, the, that, that number comes out in, the, in, in not an opportune time and yep. hard to make long-term, long-range plans, which is exactly what you're talking about doing. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Member Gately? Does that low 80s um, include FECTO? Mm -hmm. As a district. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, good. Yep. Good to know. Because... Um, mm -hmm. I think that we're doing a lot of good things, like the attendance policy, you know, like over a period of years should improve that, mm -hmm. and that change in the high school schedule yeah. will make it more interesting for students to go to school mm -hmm. and to learn sure. and to be, help, you know, really excited about it. So, yeah. you know, running to the building because they want to learn mm -hmm. rather than running to a building where they're like a vessel, they're sitting there. So. But I thought I heard you mention something about professional development. Did you mention anything about that? Is that in the? I don't know. Oh, you did when you were talking about the equity. Oh, the yeah, the leadership professional development. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when I heard you say that, I, I would like to know, like I would like to have a list of all the professional development that you're offering district wide. So. <laughs> Um, when people are talking to me out in the district that don't have a professional development 
to take because they're saying they don't have them. So I just would like to see a list of what's being offered so I can say, no, you're wrong. Here's all these things that are, that are available to you. Because mm -hmm. these teachers, I'm very concerned that if they don't have the right amount of professional development, we don't have the Salem State Collaborative, but if we don't have the right amount of professional development, they're not going to get recertified. Mm -hmm. And it bothers me. It's like yeah. uh, in the back of my mind, and I'm talking like because I'm my secondary background. I'm talking about my math teachers in secondary ed, or my history teachers, or the science teachers. Are there enough professional development for them to get recertified? And they only have five years. So this is the second year I mention it. So that's why I want you to keep that fresh and maybe give me a list so I can tell them you can go here and take this if they talk to me. We have no list. We can do that. Happy to. We can do that. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and then we'll go to Miss. We'll go so to you mentioned if, like, Lynn English at 70% right now, but if we reach 66.7%, you're going to do a turnaround status. Is that like turnaround status, like an <coughs> academic base? Um, because I feel like, like, learning wise, it's all about the environment. And mm -hmm. students at Lynn Classical and Lynn, um, Lynn Tech, I feel like they have more fun and, mm -hmm. like, they love their school. Mm -hmm. And then within Lynn English, like, I feel like on social media alone, we say that we do not want to go to school more often because yeah. of yeah. what it is. That's an excellent question. So um, the Department of Education establishes a threshold that all schools must stay above um, to stay out of what they call uh, turnaround status or a school requiring assistance, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's, it's just a... Um, a very focused set of activities the school has to engage in to to improve um, and I'm going to talk about the work that's happening at classical in just a few minutes and it, it's actually been really good work um, as far as the schools go I, I'll tell you so I've been I don't know uh, I, I can't even tell you the number of schools that I've been that I've visited. It's a lot, uh, but one thing I would say is that no school that I've been in is like the other. They're all very, very different and very unique, and different schools work for different students in different ways, right? So some people, um, you know, when I think about because I've spent a lot of time in classical, I've spent a lot of time in English, and they feel very, very different, but they both feel good. One is has more is more structured than the other meaning um like classical and this is not <laughs> i don't want anybody to think i'm it just it, it feels looser right mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, at, at english it feels tighter some students find comfort in the tightness and of that structure while others find comfort in the looseness of the culture <laughs> nothing wrong with either one of those cultures um both positive in, in, in many ways. Um, but I, but, but I, I think, you know, for some students who experience that tightness, maybe they don't like it as much, and they might say, I don't have any fun here. Um, but they might find, um, you know, the classical culture more engaging. There might be a classical student who would say the exact opposite. Um, hey, geez, you know, I, I, I need more structure. I want more tightness, um, and would find that uh, at English. So. Thank you. And text in the middle. Thank you. Member Castellanos. <coughs> he's passing to me. Member Coppola. <laughs> he's doing ladies before gentlemen. Yes. <laughs> um, on last year in May, we were sent this that showed the dropout rates for the 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Doesn't have obviously the 19 because it was last year. But how. How is it, let's say, for instance, on 18, it's 14.9% on this. But then on this 18, it's 4.5%. Right. So you have to remember that what, what's represented in that stacked column is over four years. What comes out annually is the dropout. That's over one year. Okay. So it's one versus four. So Josh, am I correct on that? Okay. Okay, so all of those would be in there. Mm -hmm. And um, last year we were using Lowell and Worcester in here. And I, I think it might be a good idea be, if we could. This, this That's what we were given. We sent, okay. you, you sent it to us. Yes. Okay. 
but it's the same uh, when you do. So the slides you sent me for a dropout will have Lowell in there. Okay. Okay. So when, because when their, their numbers are so good that, you know, I almost feel like that's what we should be looking at, not, mm -hmm. um, not looking at, you know, well, we're ahead of this group and that group and, you know, this couple behind us and some ahead of mm -hmm. us. But to really make, you know, what is Lowell doing and Worcester doing mm -hmm. that's, that's made a change? And, and maybe they can't explain it to us. So, I mean... It, and then maybe remember, they can. Maybe we can learn from Lowell in Worcester. Right. You know, for that. So some of it, some of it is is, um, and I remember, remember Nicholson asking this question a couple of years ago. Um, some of it has to do, and and this is just being completely blunt, with the demographic of student that you're serving, right? So, you know. They may have a similar number of English learners, but they may be English learners from places where you know they, where there's more advanced education. There may be English learners um, who are arriving with less trauma, uh, who can you know sort of plug into the you know the education and the environment more readily than the group that um, that we're serving. And so, part of the answer lies in that. Uh, that does not mean that, that, that there wouldn't be something for us mm -hmm. to learn uh, from the folks in Lowell and folks in Worcester. Um, but it's not always apples to apples when you look at the, like, who we're serving. Okay. But it's worth a try to see if there's oh, sure. something that they're doing that we could use. Yeah, and especially seeing that we got a big smile from Kevin McHugh down the other end, who used to serve on the Lowell School yeah. Committee. Yeah, he knows. And he's proud of those figures, obviously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Member Castellanos, then Member Ford. Um, thank you, first of all, um, for the data. Data tells a story. As I mentioned earlier, I've been seeing data all day today. Um, data tells where the needs are, where our strengths are. Mm -hmm where the vision and the future looks like. Um, I want to, first of all, start, start off by congratulating uh, Principal Dunn and her team, Link Classical. Uh, it's, it's very uh, inspiring to see the turnaround and what, you know, what's been done uh, to move that school forward. Um, I want to also, you know, discuss, you know, Fecto Larry. I understand the, the correlation, you know, in, in terms of just um, the demographics and what we face and what student, you know, inequities and what we're trying to do there. Um, sustainability is important and figuring out what we need to do to move this district forward is something that is being done um, today. Uh, we went to a LEAP after school, school program orientation uh, where many of the community and stakeholders involved were there and learning about the stuff that's happening in, uh, in our schools, uh, particularly this is Marshall Middle School. Um, I'm inspired uh, by what's happening. Um, and towards the end of this, um, your presentation, um, you discussed, you, you described uh, students who are working 20, 40 hours a week, and you're talking about some of the the obstacles and factors that lead to kids who drop out, and I felt like you were talking to me. Because mm -hmm. all due respect, I was that kid. So five years from now, I appreciate you setting the expectation that high. Um, I've buried friends. I have friends incarcerated. Um, I'm not really, I don't, I, I don't have as many people in my circle when I first started. Um, so I take it very personally. Um, to achieve equity takes cooperation, uh, it takes diligency and, and, and consistency, um, and to compete. I love how you say you like it, it, that inner com competitive nature with law. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Um, it's something that's it's so important for the children of the city and why I'm here. Uh, many of my colleagues will stand and say the same thing. Um, we want the best for our students. Um, the Student Opportunity Act uh, definitely, uh, when I see the data um, over the years, I feel like our public education has been taking a lot on their back. And a lot of folks around the district have been taking a lot 
on their backs with little resources. And I, I really appreciate it. I look forward to see how we delegate those uh, services and what we have to, to really develop that equity and to not just talk but walk it out and let's do this. And that's how I felt after you, uh, you discussed and shared your end remarks, Superintendent, and it's very much appreciated to, to hear the programs and what we're looking to do. Um, it's uh, just, to, just to echo what Member uh, Nicholson mentioned is that to hit those targets, to set those benchmarks, to make sure that we do have a target so we can have an aim instead of just, you know, getting stuck in positions where we lose time. Because when we lose time, we lose children. So every child matters. So when we talk about attendance initiatives, when we talk about trying to figure out um, how to, to combat uh, the, our social emotional learner um, factors, um, I believe we can do it with the smart investments in the team that we have. Um, and I'm just very proud of what the work is, uh, what we're doing. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Member Ford. I just wanted to quickly mention the, the after dark program, which you, you spoke of. And to me, I think it represents the greatest philosophical change I've seen around here in the last couple of years. I think it's a great thing, you know, I, I, for a junior and a senior to be sitting in high school and little or no chance of ever going to college. This represents a light at the end of the tunnel, and I, I think this is going to make a significant change yeah. in the graduation rate. Yeah. It'll, it'll give these kids an alternative to a reason to stay in school. Thank you, Member Satterwhite. And I just wanted to um, go back to page two, where we had the data um, by the select populations. and. In this data, we have the ELs uh, increasing and the students with disabilities decreasing. Is this uh, caused by a, an adjustment of the focus? I know that um, we obtained data from DESE that EL uh, data was going to be counted differently in the future. So was there an adjustment made and that's why this data is what it's at? No. Uh, do, do we know, do we dig any deeper to see what, why it's, why one's going down and one's going up, especially with these, uh, uh, I would say uh, these are very um, important uh, select populations in our district. Yeah. So um, first I would say, um, again, not, not being a, um, a statistician, um, you have to consider whether a change from one year to the next, one percentage, whether it's, you know, 52 to 54, whether that's statistically significant. And so, again, that, that's where these line charts uh, can be a little bit misleading, or even like a real quantitative data set can be a little misleading. Like, oh, geez, you went down. Now, why is that? Um, while the change may not be statistically significant, and I'm not trying to wiggle out of uh, an answer to your question. I'm just saying that, um, you know, the change, which is, I'm trying to get this thing to tell I think you me. said two um, to us earlier. Yeah, it's like three, it's like a 3% change on the, the downward trend for uh, special education. Um, I, I, what I would do, this is one reason why I'd prefer to do it every other year. I, if next year we come back and that trend has continued, then I would have two years to talk about, like, what influences what factors what variables has led to a downward trend over the course of years but in one year i wouldn't necessarily say be able to say with um, as much confidence it is this I, that's what i have trouble with because this is important data to have and and we need to be um, proactive and not necessarily reactive mm -hmm. and if we did wait two years mm -hmm. it might be too late when the change is one or two percent, when it's that small, I don't know that I would say that there's a, a a an issue with whether up or down. Like you know, there's something that we did differently that made that difference. If it was continuously trending down over years, then we'd be able to better pinpoint something that we weren't doing right. That was my because it's already it's already passed. This data is already passed. That's correct. So this is last year. You know what I mean? Uh, that's Actually, the last four years. Last four years, but at least the, the most recent, 2019, is mm -hmm. last school year, not this school year. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's, it, it, we would then be possibly two, two school years away from the, the, the data that we eventually get if we do it every other year. Right, and this may not be the data that you would want to look at to sort of 
right, there's all sorts of data that, that impacts this, and there's much more formative data that impacts what we, or drives what we do day to day, week to week, quarter to quarter. Um, I just want to be careful about um, assigning deep meaning to a 2% change in one year. That was, that was my only thought. No, I understand. And obviously attendance is extremely important, making sure the kids are in school. Yeah. That data is something, you know, that's, that's important. Graduation rate has a, a multitude of factors. Lots of things. Yeah. So I understand that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. My pleasure. Um, next on the agenda is um, new business. After speaking with um, Attorney Myhos, I have decided not to resend the vote for the attendance supervisor. Thank you, Attorney Myhos. Just taking it off the table. Let's take it. Take it off the let's table. take it off the agenda. Off the agenda, not okay. the, table. the agenda. Sorry. Uh, and I just like to ask for a two-minute recess before we go into the communication and information. If that's okay with everyone. come back uh, we'll come uh, in back into order um, with that uh, I would like to recognize uh, someone for the committee Dennis the uh, was married your last day Thank you. both recognize Thank you, you so much. the committee and the great work you do whether it's uh, a two-hour meeting or a five-hour meeting you're here <laughs> picking up the pieces after we get together and um, we just wanted to recognize your work. Uh, I know that you're finishing up um, your service with the schools, but um, uh, it's been great to have you here, and it's been great to count on you and through numerous meetings, uh, through my term as well as others. Uh, and, and so it's been great. And we have a card that we wanted to present to you, and, uh, and again, just recognize you in front of the committee uh, for the great work you did. And I don't know if there's anyone else would like to say a couple of words. I just want to thank you all. It's a big surprise, obviously. <laughs> uh, a little embarrassed by it all. We like to do that. Uh, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know what to say. I'm lost for words here. I've known a lot of you for a long time, and uh, a long time. I really appreciate the time that I've had with all of you and the short time for the new members. And uh, it's it's been a good experience for me. And uh, I'll miss the people, but. The work made me not so much. <laughs> <laughs> 11 o'clock at night. Uh. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Spend a little time with the grandchildren. Mm, that's and, great. You know, that yeah. That sort of thing. Have the best in your retirement. Yeah. Good we work. wish you the best health, yeah. and good retirement, long retirement. and healthy retirement. Enjoy your family, and thank you for all you did for the community. Thank, thank you. you very much. Congratulations.
Dennis, for last. Big Thank you. Good luck, Dennis. Wish you the best. Uh, and last on the agenda tonight, uh, we have communications uh, and information, the superintendent's report. Thank you, Dennis. Um, as we're just beyond the midpoint of the 1920 school year, it seems prudent to provide an update on Discovery Academy. Originally designed to alleviate overcrowding, Discovery Academy is a vocational technical program that currently serves 292 eighth grade students. The program largely serves would-be Thurgood Marshall and Breed students. As was proposed from the outset, students engage a traditional set of core courses which are enhanced by a Discovery series involving hands-on, project-based experiences with specific and targeted connections to vocational competencies. As is to be expected in any new program, there have been challenges related to settling into a new space and establishing a culture within a culture. Nonetheless, there are quantifiable measures of success. Most notably, the enrollments at all three middle schools are down. Further, the success of the eighth grade program thus far can be measured in the percentage of students who decided to apply to the high school program. 92% of the 292 students who currently attend Discovery Academy applied to Lynn Tech. What is more, the Discovery Academy has received 200 applications for the 2021 school year thus far. The application window closes in two weeks. As a matter of fact, I believe Ms. Karakidis is going to Marshall tomorrow to do an assembly and get kids interested. We're proud of this program and look forward to refining it in the years to come. And I did send along uh, on request um, the acceptances to Lintec for um, fall of 2020. And you can see that a big percentage of the kids accepted were actually from the Discovery Academy. Beginning school year 1819, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education shifted public schools to an entirely new accountability system in keeping with the requirements of the Every Student Succeeds Act. In, the, in this system, there are specific criteria for which failure to perform above a threshold would land a school in the requiring assistance range of the accountability continuum. This is what I was talking about earlier. As a result of the 2019 accountability, there are three Lynn Public Schools in this, in this range. Below are the schools and the criterion or criteria on which performance was below the threshold. And those schools are Marshall, Classical, and Washington STEM. When a school is engaged in work designed to improve on the criteria identified, they're defined as being in turnaround which should not be confused with the same term used to define level four schools under the old accountability system. Under the new accountability system, being, a turnaround, being in turnaround means engaging in a specific set of activities aimed at improvement. At a high level, each school engages the following steps in the creation of a plan with support from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Stakeholder engagement, Envisioning the future, analysis of assets and challenges, determining strategic objectives and initiatives aligned to turnaround practices, identifying district systems of support, and identifying goals, benchmarks, and progress monitoring. Schools engage a collaborative process of developing a plan specifically designed to address the area of concern and beyond and elevate out outcomes. The plans are lengthy and substantive, 60 to 70 pages, which is why I did not print that off for you. Accordingly, the most visible path is to give a high-level snapshot of a completed plan. The snapshot will focus on Classical High School, as other schools are in the process of developing their plan. Lynn Classical completed and submitted its plan to DESE in June of 2019. In it, 
The team has described the development of an instructional leadership team, a diverse group of teachers and administrators that now meets biweekly to drive efforts around improving instructional practice. This includes, but is not limited to, the development of a rubric by which teachers can better understand the quality of a particular lesson. Ultimately, there's an effort to ensure that lessons meet the depth of the instructional standard and exemplify academic demand. From a research standpoint, the quality and rigor of of instruction is at the core of any improvement initiative. Additionally, there is an effort to increase and expand access to early college, the substance of which has been presented in recent school committee meetings. Classical also intends to improve culture and climate by increasing mental health supports. This includes, but is not limited to, the development and implementation of the BRIGHT program which was also presented here. Bright, uh, as a mental health support, is a mental health support aimed at meeting the needs of students who have extended absences due to mental health challenges or hospitalization and require support transitioning back to school. Also in the plan is the implementation of the Youth Harbors Program designed to support unaccompanied homeless minors and addressing the hierarchy of need around shelter and food. Addressing these foundational needs allow the student to remain engaged and successful in school. And finally, the plan for classical requires district systems of support. This comes in the form of supports through the framework of support, it's a lot of supports, including but not limited to executive professional development for the principal, additional math professional development, and increased staff. Every plan calls for specific, quantifiable outcomes. It should not be a surprise that there are outcomes related to increased graduation rates, advanced coursework completion, and achievement rates for all, and specific targets for identified subgroups, as well as decreased dropout and chronic absenteeism rates. The Turnaround Grant provides funding for third-party progress monitoring. The report you received in your packet as well as the document attached, there's a newer one, um, to this report offers a snapshot of the forward progress Lynn Classical is making. The CLASS protocol was developed by the Center for Advanced Study of Teaching and Learning at the University of Virginia. The protocol includes 11 classroom dimensions related to three domains, emotional support, classroom organization, and instructional support in addition to student engagement. When conducting a visit to a a classroom, the observer rates each dimension, including student engagement, on a scale of 1 to 7. Clearly evident in the attached document is the fact that there was improvement in every domain on the last progress monitoring visit. Classical is improving. Lastly, attached to this document is a plan to evolve the BREED, nationally recognized, I should mention, uh, BREED All-Stars program with the addition of a therapy dog to their family. Paid for by the generosity of District Attorney Blodgett, the dog will be housed with the coordinator of the All-Stars program, Lauren Phelps. The plan is for the dog to be a part of the after-school and summer programming with hopes that this body, you, would consider a daytime role at a future date next spring at the very earliest. In the attachment, there is specific information about the intensive training and onboarding, as well as allergy information on protocols. To say that the team is excited about the addition would be an understatement. That is all. Member Nicholson. Thank you. Um, I I wanted to ask a couple questions about the classical report. Um, I think it's, it's really encouraging to see that kind of increases, and I know that's a lot of hard work. Mm-hmm. Uh, one question I had is, I think, as, as, as we talked a lot about data tonight and, and have over the last, a lot over the last few years, mm-hmm. and I think one of the challenges of, of looking at data, using data, is that it, it has pushed education generally to use, to, to rely too much on test scores. Uh, mm-hmm. and trying to quantify things that are hard to quantify. Uh, this obviously takes a different approach in terms of evaluating mm-hmm. the uh, teaching and learning that's happening in the classroom. Have you gotten feedback from teachers as to whether uh, they feel like this is a uh, helpful tool in the, the numerical one through seven 
um, ratings. Almost want to. She did not come here to present. She came to sit in the audience. Um, I have not directly received any feedback on that. I will say that um, when classical um, began this turnaround process, there were more. There was more than one um, third-party progress monitoring supporter, and um, this one was chosen. And Schoolworks and Air. There was a, maybe another one. This one was chosen um, specifically because of the depth of um, their work, the incredible feedback that other districts who had partnered with them um, gave. So I don't have direct feedback from teachers on the development of uh, their tool and uh, the substance of this feedback, but my sense is um, they're probably pretty happy with this feedback thus far. Okay. Yeah, I think it'd be worth maybe exploring, try to get some of, some of that feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that obviously one way to look at this is uh, the year over year. If we if we are happy with this as a tool, and you are getting positive feedback from teachers mm -hmm. that yes, this is good feedback, and this is really capturing what's going on inside my mm -hmm. classrooms, is there is there a way to see uh, how this compares to other schools? Because because looking at it in a vacuum, I I wouldn't like are we, is it the 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 fact that we like we, we do really well on the negative climate is that something that's like particularly done well at classical uh, or is that something that is universally well done and, and we're, we're all focusing on the analysis and inquiry which is something that's local. yeah that, that that's a good question I mean I was having a conversation with um, Shannon Gardner who's partnered um, with the school on some of their work and I don't know that those reports are made public um, but she did get some anecdotal feedback that on some of the domains, um, the growth um, was pretty remarkable. Um, and then even the start point um, where the school, uh, you know, in the first year where they landed in terms of their scores was, was you know, pretty remarkable. Uh, but that's just the anecdotal data. I, we, we can check and see if we can get some comparable. But um, I don't know that those reports are public. Member Satterwhite. Um, <clears throat> uh, so the, the observers are people within the district or outside? Um, are they from DESE or from a third? They're from uh, AIR, which stands for the American Institute for, for Research. Okay. Um, and, you know, obviously we're, we're looking at the overall average for each domain, but some of the domains um, uh, were at the same level year over year, and uh, I think there was only one that um, that that dropped uh, the instructional dialogue. Um, what 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 changes were put in place? Um, so th this is a plan, like the district uh, strategic plan, right? So there's year one we're doing this, year two we're doing that, year three we're doing that. So what took place from year one to year two to drastically increase these uh, ones that almost doubled over time? Like uh, productivity went from 5.8 to 6.6. 6. Um, uh, the inquiry went from 2.9 to 3.6. You know, there's drastic increases. So, I mean, the, the simple answer is professional development. Okay. Um, whether it's focused professional development on um, activities that are rigorous and demanding, higher order thinking skills, um, activities, or um, intentional, and some of this could be the result of the um, English learner professional development, um, you know, teachers learning strategies around how to increase dialogue in the classroom, um, student to student uh, talk to build understanding really where, where the uh, rubber meets the road, I almost want to invite the principal, professional development is really, really important. To and the funny thing about it is if you look at the domain after you say something like that, um, the regards to students' perspectives increased. That sounds like something you learned in professional development. Mm. Um, productivity. Again, if you're doing the same thing and you learn how to do something different, that productivity can increase. So that's the increase there. And the instructional learning uh, uh, formats, again, you learn that through professional development. Mm -hmm. So I see what, you, what you're saying, and that's great to be able to hear, well, I believe this is how it is. And then you see the actual mm -hmm. data points, and you say, hey, well, now I know why they increase substantially, because the professional development is, is vital. I know we've only had we three times 
uh, has it been three early release? Uh, today was the second. Second. But they've been engaged in professional development yeah. over the course of last year. And okay. Yeah. Extensively. Well, I, I like to, I, I can't wait to see what it brings to the district. Yeah. Thank you. Great. 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 Emma Castellanos. Just quickly, um, the Breed All Star, um, the, the the Joy Initiative. I love that. Um, thinking of, that's and that's thinking outside the box. Um, very grateful for um, District, District Attorney Jonathan Blodgett's um, uh, kindness. Uh, that's a really great add-on. Mm -hmm. um, I just have a question with the end. It says the the dog. So how how is it going to work? With the, how, how many students? Like I, I see the timeline on how how, how are we gonna actually accommodate the use of the dog? Like, what do you what do you what do you mean? mean? It means like per student, like turn like do do you sign up for the like what's the no? So um, in one of my previous schools, we had two therapy dogs. Uh, to be clear, I just want to be clear that this what I talked about in my superintendent's report it's for the after school program I just want to be clear about that yeah. but in my uh, one of my previous schools we had two um, that were there all day long uh, and sat in the guidance office and um, therapy dogs are highly highly trained um, to detect uh, emotion uh, and typically and they can also they're, this particular one is bred to um, I think they can smell when you when you're uh, when you're anxious or depressed, like they're, the, the, yeah, they can smell that. Uh, and typically what they do is they come and they sit next to you and you pet it. And it works and you feel better. Hmm. I mean, that, that's really the calculus. Um, <laughs> that's, that's really what, what happens. <laughs> like, I, don't know to, I have seen it uh, at my previous school um, two schools ago where – you know the dogs know when someone's upset, and they go and they sit next to the person, and it's calm. Well, I love the timeline, and I think it's it's, it's a great layout of what we want to do, and it's definitely well trained. I could see um, American Kennels Club, Canine Good Citizen Test. Yep. This is going to be this is a great add on. Yep. I'm very grateful for uh, this. Thank you, Member Gately. All right, Patrick. I like this instructional support domain and this increase very much. And my big question is, is it at English? The, so is this is... Added for English? Like no. We, this is part of the turnaround process at Classical. All right. So English, can it, some of it, now that we have this money, could that instructional piece go over to English to help them to improve before we even go into... I mean, you, you, any district can um, decide to, almost when you, any district can decide to engage a school in turnaround practices, even if they're not in turnaround. We already kind of do that. And if you remember back in the um, accountability presentation, we have schools that are on the cusp. Yes. English is one of those schools. Yes. And we provide additional supports for them. They're not on the level that classical is receiving because there are grants available to support. These are not cheap endeavors. Uh, but there are grants available to support um, those particular features. But but English is receiving um, additional supports through the framework. Through support. the framework through our internally. Okay, so teachers at English High School will be provided the professional development that they need. Um. I'm not sure that I follow what you're saying. So this is a classical initiative, initiative as part of being in the requiring assistance um, end of the, uh, the accountability continuum. But did you just tell me that it's, some of it's gone over to English? No. What I said was um, we are free to engage in those same sorts of practices mm -hmm. Um, in a school that's not in turnaround status, we could do that. Um, what we do um, is offer schools who are not in turnaround status but close um, additional supports through our internal framework of support. So could I make Professional development would absolutely be part of that. Okay, so I think they need the professional development. 
Thanks. That's what okay. I was just thinking about that. And that's okay. Where it's, okay. I'm hearing a lot of a lot of things about professional that <laughs> development lacking, and it's obvious that they might need it. Okay. Thank you. Point taken. No other uh, another parts of the agenda. Motion. Any other questions? In to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, Aye. no. The ayes have it. Meeting is adjourned. Motion to adjourn.